I want to say a huge thank you to the speakers that have given us such cutting edge, valuable information today and packed so much into such a short time period. And they've come from all over the world, so this is a really unique experience for those of you who've got to hear them speak. Now, um, I did a talk a few days ago about weight of evidence. And the truth is the weight of evidence is so enormous that even talking about it in a fair and just way would take weeks or months. But if you do, there, there are a few databases now where you can do searches on EMF-related literature. And this is just one. This is the EMF portal. They've currently got 26,885 papers in their database. Now, when you have questions, of course, not all of those papers are going to be directly relevant to the question that you have to ask, but it shows roughly what huge volume of literature there is on the subject of EMF and health. And when you look at certain subsections of literature, the weight is absolutely overwhelming. The majority of studies in general show effect, and we don't need that. To be clear, in terms of warning the public or even being ultimately sure about a health effect, we never expect 100% of papers to show an effect. We don't even need the majority. Frankly, a handful can be very important because it's dependent on methodology. So it's not a paper off anyway, but if it was, that would still win this debate. So we have both quality and quantity of literature in a remarkable number of areas. One, one thing that I hope you've been impressed by today is that I think a lot of people mistakenly think there are only very specific health concerns here, and that is not the case. This affects bodily systems at the most basic level, cellular function and structure, and that has consequences for every system of the body. So we've only skimmed the surface of the literature today, but we've all been working in this field for many years to get to the point that we're at. This isn't new to any of us. And I think all of the speakers in this room feel that there's a better way forward for humans and for other life. And the question is, how do we achieve that? I want to just quote Bradford Hill because I think this is so relevant. Here is the man who designed causality criteria back in the 60s that we're still using today because they're so robust. And the evidence, particularly on glioma or GBM of the brain and acoustic neuroma, a type of schwannoma, it fulfills those causality criteria really beautifully. So in a scientific perspective, this debate is ended, really. But even if it wasn't, Bradford Hill had something to say back then. And before I make his comment, I'd just like to point out that Professor Anthony Miller was in the room when Bradford Hill presented these criteria in the 60s. And we've, we're so lucky to have him with us today. Because that experience base is actually incredibly unique and incredibly important. We have children and young adults and students today that will never know what life was like before this revolution. And that deep-seated knowledge of how this science and politics and economics unfolded is something we need to keep hold of and treasure because it holds in it the answer to moving forward. So Bradford Hill said, all scientific work is incomplete. That does not confer upon us a freedom to ignore the knowledge we already have or to postpone the action that it appears to demand at a given time. Almost as if he could see where we would be right now. So what must we do? From a doctor's point of view, when there's a problem, first of all, we try and prevent damage as best we can, and then we try and manage what we have failed to prevent. So a sensible approach, I would suggest, is a reduction in exposure to all types of EMF emissions, anthropogenic or man-made EMF emissions. And with that thought in mind, I'll mention this group that I, I talked about briefly at the beginning, so IGNIR, which stands for International Guidelines on Non-Ionising Radiation, is a new UK-based UK group that I'm proud to be a member of. And uh, we have several members of that group, Michael Bovington and Andrew Tresider, who is the chairman of that group, in our audience today. And this will come into our discussions, I'm sure. But um, this group has formed quite recently, 
and at perfectly opportune timing, it seems, because shortly after we started meeting and discussing how to move forward, there was a big international call for new biologically-based guidelines. And we'd already started that process. So um, we felt very, very validated, I think, that the, what we were trying to do was internationally appreciated. So we comprise medical doctors, scientists, and representatives for children and EHS and other vulnerable groups. We're independent of telecommunications industry funding. We take a health-first approach and have designed these guidelines to be practically useful, but also based on real science rather than politics. So we're continuously appraising new literature, and this will be a work in progress. It will be an evolving set of documentation to guide practice in a real-life setting. But right now it's based on the Europa EMF 2016 guideline which has suggested levels, numerical levels, that you can measure and put into practice to safeguard the public and particularly sensitive populations such as children. You can find this group online and this is what you'll see for the front page of their document. And we've looked at different settings. So nighttime, for example, is a time when the body really does need protection. It's when it's rebuilding and regenerating and trying to protect health, correcting oxidative stress, for example. Um, so there are lower levels that we think are uh, more important at night time in terms of exposure. And we've got separate levels for sensitive populations. We've designated utilisation zones and exclusion zones. And these are areas where you spend a great deal of time. This is kind of obvious really, but um, because there's cumulative effects of this kind of radiation, then obviously desk areas, working areas, relaxation areas that people spend a good deal of time and somewhat arbitrarily we've said maybe four hours a day, uh, we again want to be lower. And then exclusion zones, kind of the opposite of that, inaccessible areas like right up on high ceilings where people are unlikely to spend long periods of time, we're permitting higher emissions. And just to give some idea of where our levels are sitting, so background radiation levels in green here. And the current guidelines that are being used in the UK, the ICNERP tissue heating threshold, is there in red. And this is a logarithmic <coughs> scale, so the difference between these two points is vast. And here in yellow is where currently we're recommending guidance. And you can see, I mean, actually the difference between that and natural background radiation is still very high. But the truth is that getting a level anywhere close to background radiation level at this point on the planet is impossible. So we are getting it to a level that we think we can practically implement. And we have started trying these techniques and using them in practice and getting some good results. In terms of how you achieve it on a practical level, we've included information on that, of course. And it's, again, it's not complicated. It's disabling emissions. It's using hard wiring as a replacement for RF emissions for lots of different types of devices. And... One thing I think is important, though, but particularly when we're considering a specific setting, and I think you know, we're, we're going to focus on this to some extent in the discussion group, we're here today to talk about children's health and justification for protecting children's health, and with somewhat of a focus on cancer, but obviously a huge host of other health effects. And I think trying to reduce emissions, there's a principle that is out there called the Alara Principle. It means as low as is reasonably achievable. What does that mean? Who, who decides what's reasonable? I'll be honest, I stay away from phrases like this. The Alara Principle, the pre Precautionary Principle. At this point, we're not talking precaution because we've irradiated an entire generation of people to a field that we already had evidence was harmful to health. So this, I think if we're being honest about this and from a doctor's perspective, Actually, half measures like reducing emissions to a level where there's already papers that show biological harm isn't good enough. In a court of law, I would not feel comfortable standing up and say, I think this threshold's okay when there's a load of papers that show effects below that. So the truth is, if we're going to be purists and honest about it, that half measures for reducing exposures are not good enough. It's a bit like saying to these kids, have a low-tar cigarette and that's okay. So defensible protection, if we're going to have integrity means totally withdrawing these fields in their environment. It means replacing everything with hardwired connections, shielding if necessary, although there's some concern about the biological interaction of that with natural fields. So that's a complex area. 
And the truth is we don't have all the answers. We're in a really difficult situation. There's not an easy fix to this. But so many other countries have started this process. They have reduced their exposures, especially to vulnerable groups. Vive la France for taking Wi-Fi completely out of nurseries and reducing it in primary schools. Russia have public safety limits that are orders of magnitude below our own. Sweden recognised electromagnetic hypersensitivity under the Disabilities Act, which is a step forward in terms of trying to physically achieve protection for people who are reacting physically now. Cyprus, as uh, Dr. Starkey pointed out, have done an amazing public awareness campaign. They've done a whole set of videos and a beautiful document that I'll be uploading to the FIRE website. Their terminology and their phraseology in this document is, is spot on. They point out the very serious health effects and they talk about empowering parents to be able to, to protect their own children because right now there are some very cluey parents out there who understand the science and they're faced with this horrendous decision. Do they have their child educated in school and risk serious damage to their health or do they take them out of school and withdraw their entire social network and their right to a statutory education and isolate them at home? What's a horrible decision for a parent to be faced with. But Cyprus are trying to support those parents. The USA have got official paediatric statements from the American Academy of Paediatrics and great environmental doctors groups out there also giving statements. Italy have successful litigation leading to compensation and protection. And I'm always impressed by Italy because when I see um, the international declarations and petitions, the greatest number of signatories is so often Italy. And so many other countries, I don't want to downplay the excellent activity of many other countries, especially European countries on this point, and China and many others. So in terms of points of action, these are some I just drafted up, and I'm sure there are many more that people will feel passionate about, and, and that's what we'll bring into this discussion group, but these are some that I would like to see happen. Obviously, we need a rapid re-evaluation of the carcinic status of RF and ELF by IARC. And that may be some time in coming. It's frustrating, and I don't entirely understand why, because we have the evidence level, according to many experts internationally, to justify this as being at least a 2A, but many are saying a group 1. So why the wait, I do not know. But what's very important, and this is just truth, is we need not wait. IARC are a group tasked with designating this, but that doesn't mean that we have to hold back policy and protection of children until that point in time. And many co other countries are not waiting. So we should be immediately restructuring our public safety limits. We should have public statements the way some other countries now have from our health protection agencies. That is tr they're truly reflective of the science. That's only fair. I believe an immediate withdrawal of Wi-Fi phone and other RF emissions from within and nearby schools, but we'll bring this up in the discussion group. Practically, that's not easy, but sometimes what's right isn't easy. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Official acknowledgement of electromagnetic field-induced EHS. That is what the science is telling us. And we also, of course, need better, we need more funding for studies on this, given that this could be affecting the health of a huge number of people. The symptoms and signs of EHS are widespread. Just because awareness on it is poor and doctors aren't trained to diagnose it doesn't mean this, it, this could be happening on quite an epidemic level, especially as, in terms of mild symptoms. How many people have headaches, insomnia, pal palpitations, mood disturbance? These are very common symptoms and it's possible that a huge number of these people could be successfully treated by lowering their ambient exposures. We need introduction of education programs to inform medical professionals, to bring them up to date, to stop them feeling limited by their own knowledge level. And professional, truly independent academic teams to help facilitate a transition. Because if we tried to do this overnight, it would be a disaster and it would be potentially dangerous. But we can have a strategy, a careful strategy, to move into a healthier future. Government-funded assessment and mitigation programs for homes and public spaces. This is happening already in Europe. Increased chemical ELF and VLF hygiene. I think this is really important because we know there's these synergistic behaviours between toxins. So just cleaning up one isn't good enough. We should take a, 
a combined holistic approach to cleaning up all of them at the same time. Greater funding for preventative medical approaches. Immediate moratorium on 5G and any other RF deployment. This is an absolute no-brainer. A zero-tolerance approach to industrial influences on public health policy and the kinds of conflicts of interest that we're clearly seeing, as pointed out by Dr. Starkey. So thank you so much for listening. It's been uh, an intense morning, I know. And uh, we're going to have a quick break now. And then we'll have a slight restructure and move into the next session of discussion. The first part of that will be questions. So have your questions ready in the break now. Start thinking of them. By all means, write them down. We've got paper and pens here for anyone who wants to start making some notes. And um, then we'll do our best to... I know we have some media here today, so thank you to the media for coming to look at this incredibly important subject. And we'll do our best to answer all your questions. Thank you so much.